everyone, welcome back to Upside Down Data. Today I want to talk a little bit about the idea of sideline stable coins and what they can tell us about where we might be in the broader market cycle. If you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel, give the video a like and follow us on Twitter. A lot of updates, Twitter indicators, and more over there. So before I get going, I do want to give a big shout out to Jay over at Daily Crypto Analysis. Um, this really, his video that he put out um, recently really kind of inspired what I want to talk about today. So I'll leave a link to this video in the description. Jay goes over a great uh, discussion about how you can look at stablecoin and stablecoin dominance to get insight about where you are in the, the market cycle. And as I mentioned, this is really what formed kind of the seed that inspired me to, to make this video kind of adding on to what Jay had said in that video. So again, I'll link to that in the description. So to go back to this graph that I put up there first, what I'm showing you in this chart is the USDT, so Tether, and USDC dominance. And if you're not familiar with the concept of dominance, it's basically the proportion of the market cap that's being, um, that a certain asset is responsible for. So, you know, there's certain amount of money that's in USDT and USDC at any given point in time. What proportion of the total crypto market cap is being held in USDT, USDC? And obviously, because these are stable coins, you know, for every dollar of market cap that USDT and USDC has, that's, you know, one USDT or USDC that's out there. But then this is putting it into the, the context of the broader market. You know, what proportion of the market is being held or of the, the money in crypto is in these stable coins. And these being the largest one gives us a general idea about stable coins more broadly. So what I really want to do with this video is two things. I want to first talk about other ways that we can visualize this information to give us an idea about what's going on in the crypto market. Then also talk a little bit more about some nuances that we I think are important to consider when interpreting what these kind of indications mean. So what Jay talked about in his video, and I'll just show a kind of a different way of visualizing it in a minute, but what he, he talked about was how whenever this, this dominance is high of USDT and USDC, that tends to be um, kind of bottoming out points in the crypto market, whereas when this is low, that tends to be topping points. So, for example, uh, November of um, 21 or going back into the spring, you know, of, of 21 as well. And I'll show that a little bit more closely in a minute. But what I wanted to do first with this metric was just kind of uh, show a different way of visualizing it. that I think helps us, us kind of see a little bit better how overextended, you know, the dominance of USDT or USDC is. So the first thing I did is just took a regression approach. So I just basically fit the best fit regression line to the log 10. So that's what this is, the log 10 proportion. So it's basically taking the, the dominance of these and then taking the log of it and then fitting a regression line to the best fit regression line here. And that's what this yellow line is here. And then what you can do, which I think is useful oftentimes when you're looking at something like this, is that you can create an oscillator by just taking the residuals of this regression model. And so that's what I've sh I'm showing you here is that zero is that best fit regression line and we're looking at deviations um, beyond it. And what I've done is I've just um, normalized those deviations to be in terms of standard deviations. So, you know, there's some amount of variability that's going on in this. That's what this is denoting. So as you get to one, two, that's one standard deviation above the best fit line, two standard deviations above the best fit line, you know, et cetera. And so what you get is this nice little oscillator here that's generally speaking going between around negative two and positive two. And if I put the Bitcoin price, so this is the log Bitcoin price over top of this oscillator, here's where we can see really clearly how this relates to the crypto market and why, you know, it's an interesting one to keep in mind, you know, um, why it's useful to talk about. And so, you know, as Jay had, had discussed in his video, you can really see that, you know, when this, um, this, uh, this in this case, this oscillator here. Now, when this is down close to negative two standard deviations below the best fit line, then that was basically the top of the 2019 run up. And then um, conversely, you know, or well, yeah, conversely, once we started up to these higher ranges, you know, that was the March 2020 bottom was as you're getting up closer to two. Actually, the when we hit two was right before the big parabolic run that Bitcoin went into. And then, you know, when we were in that parabolic run, then we got all the way down to negative two standard deviations below the best fit line, shot up all the way to 1.5 in the summer of 21, all the way back down almost to negative two in um, November of 21. And then now we've actually gone and broken even above two. We're actually more about 2.5 standard deviations above the best fit line where we are right now in the, the you know, so far local bottom of this really nasty bear market that we have been in. 
And so really the idea is that you could you could think of this as being um, kind of something to tell you where the market is, right? Are we more likely close to a topping point, which would be when the indicator is actually low, you know, down here? Or are we closer to a potential bottoming point, like what we saw here um, or or up here in March of 2020? Really, the anomaly, anomaly in the bottoms is, you know, I guess you could argue this is a local bottom, but, you know, this was right before a parabolic run. And so generally speaking, when you're just looking at this oscillator, you know, you'd rather be in these levels. You know, you'd rather be buying Bitcoin up in these levels here, not so much in these levels here. So generally, this is more of a distribution zone. This might be more of an accumulation zone. And that's what's, I think, useful to look at this. Now, what I want to talk a little bit more about, though, is in terms of how to actually interpret this um, this metric or this, this concept, this idea of quote unquote sideline stable coins. So um, I think Jay did a good job of talking about this, but I've seen some other people on crypto Twitter, I think really kind of confuse what this is actually telling us, um, kind of getting it wrong. And that's why I want to talk about today. So when you hear a lot of people, so I've seen people on crypto Twitter talk about a similar, um, similar metrics to this. And the way that they interpret this is just being the higher, effectively, the higher this value is, the more stable coins that are just sitting there on the sidelines. So the idea would be that people have sold out their crypto into stable coins. So there's more and more stable coins sitting on the sidelines. They're then waiting to be rushed into the market when the next bull um, uh, signals start flashing. And so you might, what they would argue is that when you see this happening, it's basically all these stable coins that are on the sidelines getting dumped into the market. And then, so, and then people are then selling out of the crypto back into stable coins, which rises this up. And they're dumping their stable coins into crypto, which is then pushing the price up, etc. I think that's the way that a lot of people um, argue to interpret this. And I think at the first glance, it's, it's like, yeah, okay, that seems reasonable. You know, it kind of makes sense intuitively. The problem, though, is that it misunderstands what this is actually coming from. Because again, the way we're deriving, so the way I'm showing it here, this oscillator, it's from dominance, right? It's the proportion of the market cap being held by USDT or USDC. And the issue there is that this proportion, this dominance, is not just being determined by the amount of dollars in USDT and USDC, is also being determined by the price of all the other crypto assets, which are volatile. And so what you'd expect is that when Bitcoin is going on a parabolic price rally, right, when its price is shooting to the upside, the, the total market cap of crypto is going to be shooting to the upside also, because, you know, not just Bitcoin, a bunch of other things ran in that time as well. So the, you know, going up to three, th around, you know, two to three trillion dollars in market cap here, in some ways you just expect the proportion of stable coins to fall, because even if the number of stable coins were increasing in this time, they're not going to be increasing as fast as, you know, Bitcoin is putting in these big parabolic rallies. And so that might just leave this proportion to fall, even if the number of stable coins has remained unchanged and vice versa, as the price of, of crypto assets falls like here, and if, if the number of stable coins remain constant, you would still expect this to rise. The proportion of the market cap held in stable coins should be going up because again, stable coins are non-volatile. They're pegged to the dollar. A, a, one USDT should be worth $1 no matter what. Now, obviously there's some minor depegs, but more or less that's been true throughout its history. And so therefore you could have the same number of USDT and USDC, but then just still see this fluctuating as the price of the broader crypto market is changing. And I just want to show you a specific example of that. So looking at more recent history. So here I just went on to CoinMarketCap and grabbed some historical snapshots of the crypto market at different points in time. So this is, is May 8th, right before um, or kind of leading into the big Terra Luna collapse. And here we can see that the combined market cap of Tether and USDC was 131, almost 132 billion. By June 12th, it actually decreased. The market cap was actually lower. There were fewer USDT and USDC out there in circulation by June 12th than by June 8th. So we actually saw a decrease in the number of stable coins that were out there. But yet, when you look at this oscillator, or you're just looking at the basically the change in the USDT, USDC dominance, it went parabolic. It went shooting to the upside, up about two standard deviations to the upside, even though the number of stablecoins actually diminished. So this does this did not mean that more stablecoins were existing, that people were selling out of their crypto and that more stablecoins were now sitting on the sidelines than existed back here. In fact, we know that's not true. There were more USDT and USDC sitting on the sidelines here at this point in the market than there were all the way here at this point in the market. So now there's fewer of them than there were here. 
So that is a very important interpretation issue that I wanted to bring up, that when you see this going up, that doesn't mean that there are more, in absolute terms, stable coins sitting on the sidelines. There's not more money sitting in stable coins as you go up here necessarily. Because we just saw that the number of stable coins can go down, but yet the dominance goes up of those stable coins. And the reason for that is that even though the number or the, the market cap went down for these, these um, stable coins, it didn't go down nearly as much as what happened to the rest of the crypto market during this crash, right? You know, to look at what happened to Bitcoin through this time, it fell off a cliff and the rest of the crypto market did as well. You know, there's some assets that are down 80% more plus from this point here. So, you know, this is obviously not anywhere near an 80% draw down to the downside. So it's this idea that stable coins, because they're stable at a dollar, the number fell, but it didn't fall nearly as fast as the rest of the crypto market did. So that's why you should see the dominance shooting up. So I think a better way of interpreting this, um, type of indicator versus talking about it as being sideline stable coins, as I've labeled it here, kind of just using the terms that other people have used. I think a better way of thinking of this is buying power. It's purchasing power. That's really what it is, is that, you know, the number, if, if you have $126 billion on June 12th, you can buy a lot more crypto with this money on June 12th than you can buy with this amount on May 8th, right? You can just see it at May 8th, you'd probably be able to buy less crypto with your 131 billion than you'd be able to buy with your 126 billion down here because the prices of the volatile assets have fallen so far, your buying power has increased. And that's what I think this is really getting at. Is that when you see this as being high, it means the buying power of a stable coin is pretty high. When you see it getting low, it means the buying power of a stable coin is relatively low relative to where the market is. And so it shouldn't be any surprise that when you see this get really low, then that people are choosing to instead just hold on to their stable coins instead of buying because, you know, the purchasing power is so low. But when their purchasing power gets to be relatively high, given where the market is, then you see people more willing to get into the market, start to, to potentially buy crypto. And it doesn't mean that they're doing it with the existing stable coins. They could be adding new liquidity into the market to do that buying. This is just saying that at any given point in time in the market, you know, stable coins have some amount of relative buying power. And we can see that as in this case, standard deviations are bought off of this best fit line that you might consider as being kind of the general amount of purchasing power that would exist on average. So just something I wanted to bring out. So I think this is a really useful indicator. And again, I recommend you go check out Jay's video where he goes into uh, talks about some other things relevant to this type of indicator. And this is just a different way of visualizing it that I think is just interesting so that you can see kind of, you know, where it is relative to some general best fit line. But again, I do think it's important to note that this does not mean that there's now a historically large number of sideline stables necessarily, or that there's in an absolute terms, there's not more money in stable coins now than there was back here. It's just that we're at a point now where the amount of stable coins there are out there relative to the value of the rest of the crypto market is especially overextended which means that the purchasing power of stable coins is kind of, you know, adjusting for time and the amount of stable coins that have existed, especially high right now. All right, if you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel, give the video a like and follow us on Twitter with a lot of updates, better indicators and more over there.